Good morning and welcome to everyone. So happy you could be here worshiping with us today uh, at Holy Word. Welcome to everyone who's watching online. God's Word is important. Amen? Amen. All right, cool. I'm done. Have a good one. <laughs> that's a fact. God's Word is important. But that's not sticky. Um, you guys said amen, and then, all right, that's the gist of it. You probably would go out those doors today, and that'd be it. I mean, you, you probably wouldn't remember it, and it wouldn't affect your life. It wouldn't change anything for you this week, and yeah, it, I'm, I'm not teaching you anything. Now, this series, Unreal People, Unreal Stories, Real People, Jesus' Parables, totally made up stories. <laughs> Unreal people, totally fake, made up, but, but the impact that it has on our lives is tremendous even today because Jesus was a master teacher and, and he's teaching us today. And I've already given you the punchline. God's word is important, but I'm hoping that when I end this sermon with God's word is, is important, they'll go, wow, yeah, yeah it is. So that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, Jesus' parable on the rich man and poor Lazarus with the punchline, God's word is important. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Uh, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place so that those who want to go from you, here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. A couple of things before we keep going. Um, this is a made-up story with made-up people. And so we have to be careful with this parable and not take doctrinal truths from it, because it's, it's made up. There's some things that we have to just clarify before we move forward from this parable. First of all, um, does this parable mean that if you have money, you're going to hell? I hope not, because we live in one of the wealthiest nations in the world. Or does that mean that if you're poor, you're going to heaven? Because the rich man was rich and he went to hell, but the poor man, Lazarus, he went to heaven. Is that how heaven works? No. Because <laughs> remember, this is made up. Okay? So don't think that you need to go and give away all your money and all your possessions and go have the dogs lick your sores <laughs> in order to get into heaven. That's not true. It's a made up story. Also, does this mean that if we're in heaven, we can see people who are in hell? Or like, can the people in hell see us who are in heaven? Um, I don't know. But don't say, yes, absolutely, it says so here in the parable. It's a made-up story. In fact, the Bible talks about total separation when it talks about hell. So I don't know if maybe, maybe not, but don't, don't think heaven's not going to be sad because we're looking at people in hell. Um, I know that. And then one more thing. What's with, like, being taken up to Abraham's side? I thought... Resurrection doesn't happen until Judgment Day, but is Abraham there in body, and that's where Lazarus gets taken? Made up story, <laughs> right? That's not the point. Um, we know that this isn't before the resurrection because uh, later on in the story, there's still people on earth who the rich man wants to talk to. So let's just clarify some things. When we are reading a parable, we want to get the main point, and here's the point. You don't want to end up in hell. You want to be in heaven. 
this is not fun to talk about. But hell is a very real place. And there's like some things that we can learn about hell from this story. Um, first of all, think about what Lazarus went through. Old, starving. I mean, longing to just eat scraps that fell off the guy's table. Um, just health issues. I mean, sores forming on him. He couldn't get up and move. Even the dogs, it's like, that's like the worst part. The dogs would come and lick his sores. It's not like, aww. No, it's ugh, okay? Lazarus was going through hell on earth. And that, is, that doesn't even come close to what the rich man was going through. Hell is a horrible place. And it's a very real place. It's separation from God. When the Bible talks about hell, it describes it in other ways. It talks about darkness. Well, if God is light and hell is darkness, there is separation from God. If God is good and hell is awful torment, that's because there's separation from God. Um, if, if heaven is peace with God, hell is... the worst. And it's real. And I don't get excited to be like, yeah! Like, God, God did not create hell uh, for anyone to go to. Uh, God created hell for the devil and his angels. And you know what he did to make sure that no one would go to hell? He sent his only son to die on a cross just so that no one, not a single person in the entire world would go to hell. That's how awful the place hell is. And there's no escape. I think that's the scariest part about it. it it's eternal. It, it's final, right? You, you, you get sense that from the story. That there's no getting away from hell. But heaven. Let me tell you about heaven. The rich man was living in quite a heaven on earth, wasn't he? Man, lived in luxury, uh, had banquets all the time. That's what Lazarus had, except even better, right? Well, how does it describe heaven for Lazarus? He was at Abraham's side, and that's uh, the, I think King James says he was in Abraham's bosom, so it's like close to his chest, as if poor man Lazarus, when he died, was sitting on Abraham's lap at the banquet feast, the seat of honor with comfort and, and joy and peace and happiness in God's presence. It's an amazing, wonderful, beautiful place. And so as we're reading this story, we come to the conclusion, you know what? I don't want to end up in hell. I want to be in heaven. So how do I get that? Well, let's read the rest of the story. Again, remember, Abraham said, there's no passing between you and us. And then the rich man answered Abraham, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said. But if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Abraham said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. You got to appreciate the rich man's attitude change. Right? He's, he's there in hell. Uh, he lived a life of luxury and probably was very self-absorbed, but there in hell, he realizes that it's, he's hopeless, it's lost, he's in torment forever, he can't get any relief. He turns, wow, like, you almost appreciate what he does next. He says, can you, can you go and send Lazarus back to warn my five brothers? Because they're still on earth. Their time of grace is still there. They, they still have a chance Father Abraham, please, I want nobody, no one to be with me here in hell. And so please, please, please send back Lazarus and go warn my brothers. 
Abraham says, nope. Please! No, they, they, they have the word of God. No, 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 Abraham, that's not enough. That's not enough. But if Lazarus rises from the dead, you know, a dead guy rises and says, guess what? There's a place called heaven and hell, and you want to end up in heaven. That, that will convince them. No, and again, Abraham says, no. They have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. Can I be honest? When I was reading this, I kind of agree with the rich man in hell. I mean, it's a pretty good plan. <laughs> Someone rises from the dead and says, hey, this is what it's like, everyone. I feel like that would just convince everyone, right? I mean, what a miracle. Someone rises from the dead to tell us what heaven and hell are like. That, that makes sense. But the problem is it just doesn't work that way. Um, I don't know. I'm not into, you're into racing. Who's a, who's a good racer? I don't know. Who's a famous race car driver? Andretti. Okay. Mario? Is that? Mario Andretti. Famous race car driver. Let's say you're on the side of the road. Your car's not working. And you bring in Mario Andretti to drive the car. Right? Like, all right. The car should be working now. But the problem is there's no gas. It doesn't matter how flashy or great the driver is if, if the car's not driving. The rich man came up with a great plan. Send Lazarus back from the dead to tell my brothers not to go to heaven or hell. But the problem is, that doesn't make a difference. Because there's only one thing. There is only one thing that has the power to save people from hell. To bring people into heaven. The one thing is, Moses and the prophets. The word of God. The Bibles that are sitting in front of you. Right? That, that is the one. It's not just powerful to save people, right? It's not just like, oh yeah, this is a good thing. But it's the only thing. It is the power to save people from hell. To bring people into heaven. The Bible. The word of God. And you go, yeah, yeah. I mean, really? Because, like, you read it, and it's good, right? You have lots of pages, but, I mean, is it really, like, the power to save people from hell? Uh, uh, yeah, it is. Did you hear what Isaiah said? I don't know, if you have your service folder, turn back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, the last verse. What did it say? You who bring good news to Zion, right? Who proclaim the word of God. Go up on a high mountain. You who bring the good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up. Do not be afraid and say to the towns of Judah, here is your God. If you break down communication, it's actually fairly simple. You have the thing that's trying to be communicated, the person who's trying to receive that communication, and then just the way you get that information from one thing to another. Here we are, and we have the Word of God. Do you know what the Word of God reveals to you, communicates to you? God. Uh, the God who created the universe. Like, the big everything. The God who makes the little itty bitty. The God who knows all. The God who is everywhere. The God who is timeless. Like beyond our comprehension. How can we understand or know anything about God? And he says, let me reveal it to you. Let me communicate it to you. Let me show you me in my word. And so that little Bible that's sitting in front of you in the pew, understand what that is. That is God revealed to you. And it's more than that. What else is the Bible? What did it say in Romans? 
The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. If you want to know God, look at the Bible. And if you want to know how much he loves you, look at the Bible. Because the Bible, it's not rules. It's not a book of rules that say, all right, here's how God expects you to live. Now do it or else. No. And it's not just a story about a guy named Jesus who did it perfectly and said, all right, now follow my example. No. That's not what the Bible is. You know what the Bible is? It's a story of God's love for you. From beginning to end, the Bible is God revealing to you how much he loves you in his story called the plan of salvation. And how we are totally lost and condemned and doomed to hell, that horrible, awful place. And yet God in his love said, no, I will not let anyone go to hell. That horrible place prepared for the devil and his angels. I want all of creation to be with me in heaven in paradise. And so I'm going to send a son. I'm going to promise you to send a son. And that's the whole testament. God bringing about his promise until that moment in time comes when the time had fully come. God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law. God sends his son into the world to live a perfect life and die on the cross so you would have no sin. And he rose from the dead, guaranteeing you eternal life. That's God saying, ta-da! I did it! Not a single person in this world is going to hell. Which makes it so sad. When people take the word of God and go, man, I don't need it. I mean, that's like a person on the side of the road with no gas. And you show up with a gas tank and say, all right. And they go, no, I don't need it. The word of God is the power of God to save. Which makes it really important. <laughs> and so what does that mean for us? Um, have you guys ever heard of the 10-10-10 rule? It's, it's for like investing or being smart with your money or being disciplined. Sometimes people use it for um, fitness and health. The 10-10-10 rule, before you make a decision to do or not do something, think about yourself in 10 seconds. How are you going to feel about it? Think about yourself in 10 days. How are you going to feel about it? Think of about yourself in 10 years. How are you going to feel about it? Right? So like I could spend all my money on a nice car and that'll be great for 10 seconds and 10 days from now, but 10 years from now, uh, maybe I will wish I would have done something differently. Or like with exercising, like you could just stay home and sit on the couch. 10 seconds from now, that's going to feel great. 10 days from now, uh, 10 years from now, uh-oh. Right? And so it's a really smart thing to do with money. To think about how to save your money, invest your money, always be planning for the present, the future, and then the beyond future. Did you know that the Word of God is a lot like money? The Word of God is a lot like money. Money, 10 seconds from now, will make me happy. <laughs> money, 10 days from now, will make me happy and comforted and have peace. Money, 10 years from now, probably will make me very happy. If I have lots of money, I'll be very happy. The problem is money only gets you so far. It, it leaves out the last 10. 10 seconds, 10 days, 10 years, 10,000 years. 10,000 years from now, what does money get you? Ask the rich man. But the word of God, oh, well, that can give you comfort and peace now gives you comfort and peace 10 days from now, gives you comfort and peace 10 years from now when you've been through it, and 10,000 years from now, you know what the word of God gives you? Heaven. I've left out the context until now, the context of this story, which is really important to understand the meaning. You know who Jesus is talking to? Pharisees. Who love their? Money.
Jesus is making a point. Money can only give you so much, but it can't give you eternal life. You know what can? The Word of God. So here's my encouragement to all of you today. Invest in it. Invest in the Word of God for yourself. Understand that you are coming to an end. You will die. 10,000 years from now, where do you want to be? And beyond. Heaven or hell? I want to be in heaven. And I want all of you to be in heaven. So grab onto your Bible and read it and look at what God says in it because it's the Bible that is the power to save. And then here's the second thing. I want you to love other people with the Bible. Last week we talked about um, the parable of the shrewd manager um, and how using our wealth to make friends for Jesus, that parable comes right before this one. <laughs> so, if the Bible is the word of God, the power of God to save, what's the most loving thing that you could do? Give it to someone else. Well, today, we're going to have a presentation by a man named Chris Fluger. You know what he does? He translates the Bible into languages because the Bible has not been translated into every language. And he needs help. You know who can't translate the Bible? <laughs> I'm not good at languages. And I'm guessing not many of you are either. But he is. And you know what we can do? We can support him. And I hope we do. Not because I'm asking you to or because, right, we're a church that gives money, but I want you to support him because the Bible is everything. The Bible is the power to save. It is the nicest, most loving thing that you can do to anyone in this world is to give them the word of God. It's because the word of God saves. So again, I'm going to say, the word of God is important. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.